Our president has declared today to be a day of prayer for the victims of the floods. We want to join in on that. I was watching TV the other day and a storm came and knocked my TV out and I was so upset and the Spirit said to me these words your TV is knocked out but those people in that flood area had theirs washed out everything's washed away belongings pictures hard earned money spent to buy furniture and clothes gone everything's gone most of them 80 percent of them don't have flood insurance i'd like to say we don't have a problem here this morning I, if i've complained at all this morning i ask god to forgive me right now because i'll go home and my stuff will be there and that's all it is stuff so will you join me now as we pray for those precious people? You've watched the scenes. You've watched the rescues. You've seen the flood waters. They are still rising in some cities. It's not over yet. And it's possible that another hurricane is headed this way on our side. Folks, God will use any means necessary to get our attention. We're a nation that needs help. We are in a fallen condition. We are divided. We are full of hatred and greed. But this is our time to call on the true and living God. So we gather this morning, Lord, in this building, but with tens of thousands of congregations across the country. And we, first of all, recognize you as God. You are the only true living God. And we recognize that we have fallen short as a nation. And we have made money our God and pleasure is our reason for living oh Lord forgive us forgive us of our sins we pray for those people who found themselves being hoisted by a helicopter cable or carried by a fireman or firewoman and people in canoes with their dog and one bag of clothes and Mothers carrying babies, and they did not know where they were going. Lord, we pray for those people. We pray for the people who are still rescuing. We pray for those who are trying to get milk and water and food and clothes and blankets to these people. We understand, Lord, that unless God is our God, the nation will fall. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We understand that you've been good to us in spite of our sins. You've protected us when we vaunted ourselves. You've supplied our needs when we wasted them. You've been kind to a nation that has been unkind to itself, to its members, to its citizens. Forgive us, Lord. Let a sweeping spirit of conviction wave across this nation. Let churches go to prayer and have revival. Let preachers tell the truth and lead people to Jesus. Somehow move on these politicians to stop the senseless meaninglessness. And may we realize you raised us up. You did it. We are founded on the word of God, your word. Forgive us for veering from it and ignoring it. So with all of my heart, 
I ask you, Lord, to pour blessings on these victims and these survivors, not just today, but in the weeks and months and years to come. You're speaking to us. Let us hear you, O oh God. And I ask all of this in the lovely name of Jesus, who longs to save and heal and bless. Give us the courage to cry out for help from you, God. And we ask that in the name of Jesus, too. And all the people said amen. 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 I'm going to ask you to have a seat. I wish you wouldn't take the time to applaud. I just want to make a note of something. This is the first time in, since July, I believe, that Dennis and David and I have all been here at the same time. And I... Yeah. Since July the 23rd. <laughs> and I'm glad to see both these fellas and you and them. Isaiah 65. I want you to think about this for a moment. It shall come to pass. When? It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Man. Well, it came to pass. And we're living in that now. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. This is God saying, I am so zealous to bless you that I can't wait for you to call on me. I'm going to bless you before you call because I know what you need before you know what you need. And when you finally get to the place that you are speaking to me, I'm already hearing you. That is is the great zeal of God in our behalf. Please do not just read that and say, mm, that's good. Listen to it. It shall come to pass. And Isaiah is talking of a day, our day, that before you call, I will answer. And while you're praying about it, I've already taken care of it. Wow. I found another verse of scripture in the Psalms yesterday. Some, and when I study, I'll use many different versions. And I happen to go to the, <laughs> my least favorite version is the old King James. But I went to that one and read Psalm 21, verse 3. For you meet him with blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. Now that's the new King James Version. The old King James says, Thou preventest him with blessings of goodness. Preventest, prevent. And in our vernacular, prevent means to stop something. But in the Hebrew language, when something is prevented, it's presented. It's not stopped, it's given and presented. So what David is saying in this particular psalm is that when I feel defeated, you present me with blessings of goodness. You're already there with outstretched hand, full of blessings. And watch this, you'll need this in a moment. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. Let me tell you why he wrote that psalm. It was as a result of a battle that Israel went through. David found out that the Assyrians had hired other enemies of Israel to join them and go against David. They were outnumbered in every way possible. 
David cried out to the Lord. And the Lord soundly defeated the Syrians and the Ammonites. Soundly. It was an embarrassing defeat for them. And that's when David wrote that psalm. He was all elated. He said, look, victory is ours. In another reference to that battle, he said, God has put them under our feet. But what David didn't realize was he didn't kill the enemy. He just drove them back. And while David was rejoicing and writing and singing and dancing about his victory over the enemy, the enemy was strengthening, strengthening itself and planning another attack. Do you get it? Do you understand what I'm saying? He always comes back. You never destroy the enemy. You can hold him back. He can be paralyzed through your prayers. But as long as you are alive, get ready for another stronger attack. This victory that some of you are still rejoicing about and writing a testimony over or for uh, will be short-lived because the enemy cannot take the fact that a human being has authority over him and he will come again and again. I want to know if you're hearing what I'm saying. We tend to get very spiritual and super elated and we say, we got the victory. Well, you did for a moment. But you better keep your armor on and keep your eyes on the horizon. The enemy is coming again, greater and stronger than ever before. I don't know how to say this. I'm not, sometimes I'm just not good with how I feel telling somebody. It seems like the higher I go spiritually, my next valley is lower than the previous one. Did that, does that make sense to anybody? So I can have the highest spiritual moments and tend to forget it's not going to last. And when I go down, I go down deeper than I've ever gone before. So it is continually higher and lower events and emotions in my life. Don't forget that. If you do, you'll start blaming yourself that you let the enemy come back. You start feeling guilty. Well, is there some sin in my life that I still haven't asked forgiveness for? I haven't been cleansed from? And you, you start pointing at yourself rather than understanding that this is life. This is the battle. This is the Christian walk. This is the Christian warfare. It never stops. It increases all the time. This is what happens. And you cannot figure God out. I, I, I don't know. Yesterday I... I was having one of those, uh, oh, I, don't, I, I can't even describe the moment, the, the feeling, the sensation. As I was reading scripture and studying and stuff, I just went, I don't get this. Why, why does God do things the way he does them? What, what about Moses? Folks, God could have let Moses be a leader. God could have just let them drive him out to the wilderness to stay 40 years to learn who God is and who he is and that he's to be a deliverer. But why did God let him murder somebody? What's the point of the murder thing? Are, are you still with me? <laughs> he could have raised David up to kingship. Why let David commit adultery? Why let him kill his best friend? Why would he let him live in a lie for so long? Why couldn't God just kind of uncomfortably move him to the throne rather than destroy and devastate everything inside of him and use his own sin? Why? Would God let Peter do worse than Moses and David? Because Peter, of all people, had the chance of a lifetime as he stood around a campfire that night 
And they said, he's one of them. And he cussed and swore and denied Jesus. Now, I told the council before we came in, we were having prayer. I said, I don't know. I'm just confused because Paul told Timothy, if we deny him, he'll deny us. But here stands Peter around a campfire, loudly, blatantly saying, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know that man. He totally denied Jesus. And Jesus looked at him, and Peter remembered that Jesus predicted he would do this. But just a few days later, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and stood up and proclaimed Jesus as Lord and Messiah of Israel and the only way to salvation. Why, why, why does God let a man murder? Why does God let a man commit adultery? Why does God let a man deny him blatantly and boldly and then use them? Does anybody have an answer to that? I'm sorry I don't. I cannot figure God out. I want to know why I have to go down before he can raise me up. What is it about my weakness that glorifies God? What is it about my inability to be consistent and serve him? What is it about my unfaithfulness that somehow brings God into play in my life? I don't know. All I know is God chooses people we wouldn't choose. And when he chooses you, he never unchooses you. Once God possesses you, you are possessed for eternity. You've been bought with a price, and it was the blood of Jesus. You belong to him. So whatever he decides to do and use in your life is God's business. So I guess while I'm, I'm standing here trying to figure him out, he's telling me, why don't you leave it alone? I am God. I do what I want to do, and I do it with whom I wish to do it. Sitting in this building right now are people who cannot figure out why God didn't keep them from some sin or why they are still wrestling with some sin and some weakness. Where is the deliverance? Why do I fight this every day of my life? How is it that once I thought I had victory over it, it comes back? What about total deliverance? I I thought that was scriptural. Why can't addicts be set free? Why can't old things be gone? I don't know. I know this. About the time you think you got it right, that you got it fixed, that you got it killed and conquered, you find out that wasn't the... (laughs) didn't happen that way at all. Let me show you something. I'm sure the cameras can't point in that direction, but you can. Right under here, right under the balcony, do you see all that black polyethylene back there? You know what that is? Uh, Let me tell you then. Months and months ago, we decided to increase our bathroom space here. Ladies need about five times more bathroom space. (laughs) Why is that funny? That's a fact. So we decided to, did we triple it? Triple the size? It, it didn't, well, we quadrupled it then. How's that? We quad, quadrupled the size of the ladies' facilities. Wow. Hey, I think you're missing the point here. So what do you do? We go in and put down the prettiest tile, the finest of utensils and utilities. Mirrors, countertops, space and light. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. And everybody's so happy. David, I think Nehemiah came to me the other day. Pastor, we got a, here's how he said it. Pastor, we got a problem. (laughs) And I said, what's the problem? He said, we had to shut down the ladies' facilities. Shut them down. How can you shut them down? You can't shut them down. 
they got to go to other buildings to use it. I said, what happened? He said, the floors are flooded. Tell me why they're flooded. He said, we're still trying to find out. So for weeks now, we've been trying to find out why all the water backed up. And guess what we found right back there under the balcony? One of the pipes was clogged from an old tree root. Right? An old tree root. They had to go down seven feet. Back there, seven feet. And dig that thing out. Then discovered, there's another one. <laughs> right here where Lisa's sitting, right? See that, that blue mark? That's gonna, there's a, there'll be a big hole in the floor Tuesday because they're going to find a, 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 try to clean out another root from the pipes. Now understand, the tree was cut down. The tree's gone. But the root remains. <laughs> the root stayed. And believe it or not, there was enough moisture that the roots continued to expand, trying to keep the stump alive. And so we made it beautiful. We covered it up. <laughs> but then it started coming up from an unknown underground source. And we paid a price right back there and are still finding roots that are causing us trouble and costing us lots of money. What's the point? <clears throat> That's the reason it's one battle after another. Once you think you got this fixed, you say, this is done. So you clean it up and you paint it and you put on makeup and you buy new clothes. I'm fixed. But after a little while, even though the tree has been cut down, even though the tree of sin in your life is cut down and you've been forgiven and washed clean by the blood of Jesus, there's still some rootage. Yep, in me... In you, in everybody, there's some rootage underground, <clears throat> way down deep, in the dark, that keeps the flow and clogs, keeps the flow from being able to freely disperse itself. It clogs up everything in your life. And by the time you think you can flush, Am I making my point here? Yeah. And that's why I tell you this. As long as you live, you're going to have to deal with backup. <laughs> Clogs. Lack of drainage. Smelly stuff. Ugly stuff. Dark and muddy stuff. Oh, you can act like everything's all right. And you can get in church and, woo, I'm glad, I'm glad. Sin is gone from my life, hey. Oh, no, it's just a matter of time before anger, bitterness, strife, prejudice, greed, lust of all kinds begins to seep through the old roots. And that's why, my friend, this battle will not stop until we get to heaven and the whole rooted system is ripped out of us. So you're going to wrestle with it. You're going to struggle with it, which makes that scripture all the more important to me. I don't feel like God's going to answer prayer because I've got such a bad attitude. I don't feel like God is moving in my life because I feel totally uninspired and totally unspiritual. But God has answered my prayer before I pray it. And God will bless me before I realize how good he's been. You can't stop the goodness of God any more than you can stop the rootage way down deep inside. 
For every old nasty root, there's grace upon grace upon grace. And God will provide his goodness and righteousness to you. Can you hear me? You set a crown of pure gold on my head. That's what David sang before he even went to battle. He said, it is a done deal. I'm not going in to fight to win a crown. This is the best thing I've said yet. I already have a crown. I'll go into battle wearing a crown. I'll come out wearing a crown. It's a done deal. God has already taken care of it. But that does not mean that I'm not brokenhearted and discouraged and scared. There isn't one person in this choir today that doesn't have something hurting you or somebody weighing you down. There's not one of you that isn't feeling pain or stress about something. And we're all going to heaven. We're all saved. But I'll tell you, brother, the older I get, <clears throat> the more questions I have. The older I get, the less I can explain. But the older I get, the more I believe God is who He says He is. Amen. That He's already put a crown on my head. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm worried this morning about some things. I said worry. I guess I could, you know, put a little spice in it and say I'm concerned. I'm flat, stinking worried about some things. Jesus told me not to, but I am. I'm struggling with it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Lift your hand up. Just lift it up. I'm a concerned man here today. I'm a worried man. And I have faith in God. Don't say if you had faith you wouldn't worry. Shoot. <laughs> I just told you I'm on my way to heaven. I'm a child of God. Nothing will ever change that. That's faith. But I'm struggling with life right now. I'm struggling with all kinds of stuff in me and around me. So I think we ought to have prayer this morning. Amen. Stand up with me, please. If you are worried, yes, I said it. If you are worried about something, burdened about something, or somebody. See, there's nobody in here that doesn't have somebody that's giving you a problem. And I don't mean trying to sue you, beat you up or anything. You love them. You love them. You love them. If you're one of those persons and you're just plain worried, come down here and join me. You know, choir members, you guys can just move up here if you want to behind me. You can't get down here, but you can come up here and join me if you like. Here's the deal. I know God's going to take care of him. That's right. But I'm a little bit scared as to what he will have to do. He's good in every way. And he... But sometimes he has to do God things to get people's attention. And I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, 
Sometimes I'm a little bit scared of God. I am. I love Him. I trust Him. Sometimes I'm a little uneasy about the way He's going to do something. <clears throat> and I didn't ask you to come down here so we can pray a prayer and say, Make it all good, Lord. I'm just down here saying, increase my faith. Increase my faith. I believe, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Because those moments when I think, this is not going to happen, this is not going to work, oh God... It's hard for me at that moment to remember Isaiah saying, Before you call, I will answer. It's hard to recall while you are still speaking, I will hear you. I just can't do it because I'm frozen in this human moment. And I feel a little backup, old rootage. Things are not working on the inside the way I feel they should. But I got nobody else but Jesus. And he has never disappointed me. So, can we sing this little song that David is playing in just a moment? I want to pray right now. Heavenly Father. I know you love us better than we can imagine. And I know you see us in a way that we don't see ourselves. You see us as righteous, forgiven, holy, chosen, called, redeemed. But we, we see ourselves as limping through life, having spiritual highs and spiritual lows, feeling great at times and wondering where you are at other times. That's just the way we are, Lord. So I don't come today asking for anything except you remember, that that you help me remember. I already have a crown on my head. Glory to God. I already have a crown on my head. This battle I'm going into has already been won by the Lord. Uh, Satan may fight me, but he cannot defeat me. The enemy may scowl and hurl insults at me and kick at my faith. But when all is said and done, I'm a crown-wearing, victorious child of Almighty God. And Lord, I realize when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a bunch of scars and bruises because I am in the military. I'm in the army of the Lord. I am in a wrestling match. I am in a mixed martial arts spiritual class. I'm going through it. But you are going to bring me through it. So I do what all victorious people do. I worship you. I praise you. I speak your name into the air. Where darkness prevails and where demons think they rule... I speak the name of Jesus. I speak the name of deliverance. Victory has a name. The name is Jesus. Righteousness is the name of Jesus. Glory to God forever. And so, Lord, here I stand. I know I'm filled with the Spirit and I've been set apart by the Spirit. But I'm down in this thing called earth. I'm in the middle of warfare. So I look up. I will not look at my enemy this morning. I will look at my Savior and my Redeemer. Who will join me right now with raised hands? Will you bless the Lord?
Hola Hada Bashi. Hola Hada. You're worthy, Jesus Christ. Redeemer of my soul, I praise you this very day. I gave you my heart, it's in your hand. I gave you my mind, it's in your hand. I gave you my life, I gave you my children, I gave you my breath, I gave everything to you, Lord. It's in your hand. I worship you. You own me. You possess me. I worship you. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. word there, David. David. They put up the wrong words, so you were singing the right words. Have faith in God for the answer. Okay? I'm not trying to get saved. I'm already saved. I'll always be saved. Hallelujah. Have faith in God. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? That doesn't mean you'll go out skipping now. It means you'll go out with a crown on your head saying, the Lord has taken care of this. And I believe he has. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. See you Wednesday night.